Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio's How Stuff Works. Hello and happy Friday. I'm Tracy V. Wilson. Hooray! Yeah. <laughs> Uh, it's the end of the week, which probably means I'm on a plane. That seems to be how it works lately. Oh, I'm, uh, it's, today's Friday. I don't think I'm on a plane. I have been on a plane recently, but, uh, not today. So, safe flight, Holly, if that's where you are right now. Woo! Uh, yeah, you never know. <laughs> um, we kicked off our week on the show this week talking about the Equal Rights Amendment. We sure did. So I first uh, learned some about the Equal Rights Amendment way back in college. At, so at this point, this was in like 1994 or 5 or something like that. Mm-hmm. I took this class that was called Evolution, Revolution, and Social Change. And it was a class that was about social movements through specifically the women's rights movement, uh, civil rights movement, and gay rights movements in the United States And so one of the things that we talked about was the anti-equal rights amendment backlash. And our professor told us about women from Stop ERA going to the state legislatures and the places where they live with these baskets of, like, homemade bread and saying, from the bread maker to the bread winner. And uh, I'm I'm still mad about that idea. (laughs) That was 30 years ago almost. Yeah. I mean, when we were talking about it in the context of the show, I stopped afterwards for my uh, aside, which is a little ranty. But, like, um, yeah. Uh, I I make bread, and I'm also the (laughs) breadwinners. Yeah. Yeah. Um, As I was working on this, we had just recorded the episode on Georges Sand. Yeah, uh, and I was I like I was thinking about when we were talking about uh, her whole having a a very supportive male partner who was the person that just like made sure that she had everything she needed. I was like, what if we had T-shirts that said "From the bread maker to the breadwinner," but they depicted that scenario, and then I was like, nobody's gonna visually know what that is, and they're gonna think that anybody that wears that uh, shirt like they're not gonna get the joke. Right. It's. It's a little tricky to convey visually. Yeah, yeah. I it it was sort of also a, an interesting um, thing in my head as we were discussing this long drag out of the Equal Rights Amendment. It's a good reminder, having just come off the Georges Sand episode, that, you know, France also, for example, had their weird law on the books that women couldn't wear pants mm-hmm. until less than a decade ago. So, like, we are not the only country who has struggled with Right, This right. legislation around sex and equality. Yeah. Uh, As I was doing the research for this, I was trying to figure out uh, exactly what happened in 1923, because everything says the same thing, that it was in- introduced in Congress in 1923. Um, and then it just sort of stops. Like, there's, there's no further <laughs> conversation. Like, what happened next? So what I was trying to do was look through old newspaper reporting to see if I could get a sense of, like, what, what were people talking about after this was introduced in Congress. And one of the results I got was a New York Times article that was about a very similar amendment that had been introduced in France at about the same time and had a similar discussion about um, people wanting to add in exemptions related to women being drafted for the military or laws to protect women that were already on the books and things like that. And I was like, oh, this is so interesting. Maybe I will have some time to, like, dig into And I did not have time. <laughs> <laughs> did not have time to look farther farther into that. Um, one of the arguments about, like, w- there are arguments that I did not get into in the episode because it did not seem totally relevant. There are various arguments that people make that are like, do we even need this now because we have other legislation um, that is supposed to guarantee some kind of equality, whether that legislation is respected is a whole other question. But uh, like people have said, there's all these other laws on the books. Now, one of the points that was made was that uh, a lot of people think the, uh, that the Constitution already says that we have equal rights regardless of sex and, like, don't realize that that's not actually part of the Constitution. So there was sort of a question of, do we even need this when there are all these other laws and people think that it's already the law? 
Um, and the counter argument was like a lot of other nations that we compare ourselves to on the world stage have a constitutional or some other foundational guarantee of equal rights regardless of sex, and the United States doesn't, and that sets, a, sets us apart. So there's like a whole huge conversational thread about all of that. I had certainly known that this had been going on for a century, but it wasn't until I got your outline that I had seen the statistic that this amendment has been 10% of the introduced <laughs> amendments. And I told you while we were in a break in recording, like, to me, to my, like, sort of checklist-oriented mind, I would just want to get that thing handled so you can move yeah. on to other stuff. Like, it seems like such a huge time suck when there are certainly other things also to be discussed. Right. Uh, but I understand that there have been passionate voices uh, yeah. creating that debate. So uh, it's a it's a little bit hard to wrap my head around because it seems so obvious to me. Yeah. But I know that's not everyone's position. Yeah. Sh- surely I learned this uh, in that class that I was talking about, but I have forgotten uh, just how overwhelming the votes were in Congress in favor of the amendment and just how quickly the ratification process was going. And then, like, it got to that point of five states needed or three states needed left to go. I had a whole Monty Python moment of three versus five just then. But it, like, got to this moment of three states left to go and just stopped. It didn't stop by itself. Obviously, there was the whole backlash that we talked about that was responsible for the stopping. But anyway, I also thought it was important to note that, like, Phyllis Schlafly didn't do it all by herself. There were other people and organizations campaigning also. But she was definitely the most visible part of it. Yeah. Uh, that part is uh, is hard for me because I get real angry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I told you as we were recording, I felt like um, Mr. Potato Head and my wife had backed my angry eyes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, it's, it's tricky because, as uh, again, to me it seems so obvious what the right thing to do is there. And I understand that people will have different points of view, but, like, it is so obvious to me that that's the right thing to do <laughs> based on my life experience that it, it is uh, infuriating. Yeah. 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 Yay, anger. <laughs> <laughs> so our second episode this week was about Paul Cuffey, which was actually researched and written before the the uh, Equal Rights Amendment one, but we shuffled the order around since the Equal Rights Amendment seemed particularly timely. Um, and that made it, it's just sort of strange little time warp when I was actually recording them in the studio somehow. I was like, when did we talk about this? I don't remember. <laughs> uh, that happens to me all the time because uh, sometimes we're working a couple to three weeks ahead if we're in a good place. Mm-hmm. Um, and then also because we do so many episodes. I mean, if you consider each of us, on average, we're each researching and writing an episode a week. Yep. 52 weeks a year. Yep. If you ask me four weeks from now what we talked about that I researched, I will have probably only vague outlines and shapes <laughs> ready and available for me to converse upon. Yeah, we've also been in a place recently where we normally epi- we normally record two episodes a week in the studio. Um, for various reasons, we have had sort of a rolling third episode that, uh, like, we haven't had time to get to the third episode in our studio session, so that one gets bumped to the next week. So, like, Paul Cuffey was simultaneously one of the, like, third episodes that got bumped to the next week and then got swapped with the Equal Rights Amendment Um, so this morning I had to really refresh my memory. One of the things that we did not get into in that episode that I did learn about when I was researching it and found really interesting, um, is that because of the indigenous involvement in the whaling industry in the centuries that we were talking about, especially the, like, Wampanoag involvement in whaling, There are indigenous people and indigenous communities around the world who can trace their ancestry back to tribes and nations living in New England, including New Zealand in particular as one place where either whalers got there and said, you know, I'm done whaling. I think I will live here now. Or maybe the captain of their ship was like, you're done whaling and this is where you live now. Either way, there are threads of people on the internet who are kind of tracing their ancestry 
back and discovering that they have roots in the Wampanoag community or uh, another uh, tribe from the northeastern United States, which I just found to be interesting. But in a in a less, well, I just a more horrifying note. Um, there are also indigenous communities in the Caribbean who trace their ancestry back to uh, New England that are more related to the thing that we talked about or mentioned very briefly in passing, which was people being enslaved after King Philip's War. Um, and I'm working on a King Philip's War episode because I felt like that was a lot to drop in there without much explanation. <laughs> yeah, it is it is fascinating because I here's where it's really fascinating to me. I think from the perspective of someone who lives in the U.S., not in New England, we tend to think of New England as a little enclave. Like, it's got its own unique personality. And it doesn't seem like a thing that would have tendrils all over the world. Yeah. So it's kind of a cool thing to realize. Like, it is not always cool how those people landed in various other places. Sure. But it does make very clear, really, in some ways, how tiny the globe is. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I will say, having lived in the South and New England, um, that L- New England does feel uh, more insular to me in some ways. Like, the states are all a lot smaller. <laughs> uh, when I was living in North Carolina or Georgia, I did not typically just go drive to another state for some reason, because the, that was going to take at least two hours from the most of the places that I lived. Um, Not so much the case in a lot of New England. Um, And often when I am looking at the biography of somebody who lived in New England during, like, the colonial period, uh, it feels like everyone was related to everyone else because it is, like, such a smaller geographical area and so many more interconnections um, among people. So, yeah, I, uh, I am... A little, and I guess surprise isn't isn't quite the right word. Um, but having learned about more about Paul Cuffey and and about how much he did in his life and how influential he was in this part of New England, it it uh, I wish he were better known than yeah. he is. His his story is one I didn't know at all. Me neither. And I I love it. Yeah. Um, I know that whaling is a very contentious issue. Oh, yeah. Uh, for, especially involving commercial whaling and animal rights and all of that. Um, if you have been, at, like if you live in the New England area and you have been thinking about going to someplace like the New Bedford Whaling Museum, I didn't really know what to expect when I went to that museum because I was there to learn about Paul Cuffey. Um, and there is a lot about like, uh, whaling as a practice at that museum. But there's also a lot about, uh, at least in terms of the exhibits that were there when I was there, there's a lot about the indigenous peoples who have whaling as part of their indigenous history and culture and what that has meant for those cultures. There's a lot about whale conservation um, and a lot about whales in general. So if you were kind of imagining a place that you're going to show up and it's going to be um, a big walls of harpoons, while there are a couple of walls of harpoons, there's like a lot of other stuff that's more about um, culture and history and uh, conservation and not about this is how people uh, killed whales. <laughs> right. Well, and it's, it's... I have not been to that museum, but it sounds like it contextualizes... Yeah. That information about how people killed whales and how it was yeah. more than just uh, going out on a, yeah. a little hunting trip. Um, the <laughs> uh, the place where uh, where Paul Cuffey lived is also not far from New Bedford, but um, we were we were tired after our museum, and so we returned home to north of Boston. <laughs> so, thanks for stopping by for our casual Friday. Uh, if you want to write to us, we're at History Podcast at iHeartRadio.com. Thanks again. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio's How Stuff Works. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. <laughs> <laughs> 